Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Chris Ensco. Chris is co-founder and CEO of Ripple, a venture-backed startup redefining the next generation of mental health for seniors. Leveraging a value-based approach, disruptive technology, and a relentless focus on empowering its clinicians, Ripple is pioneering a new care model to dramatically expand access to high-quality, wraparound mental and behavioral health care for seniors, their families, and caregivers. Most recently, Chris served as president of Aegis Living, one of the nation's leading innovators in providing assisted living, memory care, and wellness services to seniors. Prior to jumping into senior health, Chris spent over 16 years at Starbucks Coffee Company, where he held multiple senior leadership roles, including president of the company's flagship U.S. retail division, and earlier as president of Starbucks Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Previously, Chris worked for Madrona Venture Group, a Seattle-based venture capital fund, and earlier in his career, he was in public service. From 1993 to 2000, Chris held several positions in the Clinton White House, including assistant press secretary and personal aide to the president. He received his BA in public administration from the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. Welcome, Chris. So good to see you. Thanks for having me, Sean. Good to see you. I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire first. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. What's your favorite? This is such a hard question. I hate this question, actually. What's your favorite movie? Do you know, I'm watching all the World War II movies with my, my 10-year-old son right now, so I have to say Saving Private Ryan. We just got back oh. from Normandy, and I'm just so... That was just such a time... I mean, those movies came out like 20 years ago. Wait, is and your son watching it? He is, yeah. Is he freaked out? I'd be like scared the shit out of a 10-year-old. I, you know, my wife and I have debated that whether he should be watching those movies, but he's just so into the history, and we just got yeah. back from Normandy, and he's just like... I just love that I'm learning more than he's learning. And I just really cool. love that. So we're That's watching. Cool. Those what's movies. your, what's your Starbucks order? Oh, like a uh, tall pike place. Nothing fancy. Like I oh. love black coffee. That's um, I have to have like three of them every morning. All know? right. I feel better. So you might as well just get the venti or then it gets cold. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it's probably better for your budget that. to just go for the venti. No. Uh, yeah, I'm terrible. I, you know, I worked at Starbucks for many, many years. I still love truck stop coffee. It's just an Arkansas thing. Like I grew up that way in the heart. I get it. I love it. I get it. Um, if you could have lunch with anyone, I guess, you know, alive or someone who's passed away, who would it be? Uh, I think that's, man, that's such a tough question. That's a lot harder than the movie. I would say, you know, I still love, I mean, if you could be anybody, I would pick Nelson Mandela. I just think that's just... We have so few people alive today or dead that, you know, are really like world, you know, people that the globe could follow and learn from. And I just, I think that's just an amazing story. Um, yeah. No, totally. Love that um, is there, I don't know if you're a reader, but if so, what are you reading right now? Uh, the most impactful book I think I've ever read is Strength to Strength. And you and I were talking a little bit about age earlier Um Arthur Brooks uh, wrote this book, I guess, two years ago now, and it's all about uh, how to be happy in the second half of your life and how your brain chemistry sort of orients it, you, you know, what you can do kind of lean into your brain chemistry in your career in your second half to be super happy and super fulfilled. And I, I literally re-listened to some of his podcasts every two months. That was the book that I read that I just, I loved and I've learned so much from it. it was like it just arrived for me at a perfect time. I want to read this book. I think it's perfect timing for me too. Well, I think I think Matt, it's funny, Matt McElwain, who I used to work with at Madrona Adventure Group, mentioned this book to me like when it first came out and he goes, this book is going to change your life. You got to read it. And how many people say that to you? So, you, you know, you write it down and you get to it at some point. And when I, re when I read it, I was like, God, it's almost like he wrote this book for me. That, and oh, I, think I can't wait to read it. The same way. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully it's on Audible. People, yeah. You and I are both 51 and we have all this life ahead of us. We can do kind of anything we want to do. And it just helps you think about brain chemistry because there's just stuff going on in your brain, right? That, that, that you either lean into or, you know, you don't want to swim upstream. You want to go with the flow and it's just so good. Um, okay. Like, now it's I'll making me want to like get on Amazon right away and get it. Um, is there a quote that you tend to reference or live by or uh, that resonates it's still overused, but I love that Teddy Roosevelt man in, man in the arena. Oh, quote. the like the Everybody guy up at yes, I love that quote also. 
it's a favorite. I mean, now now everybody's adopted it, and you see it all over the place. Um, but I still think that is just such a, a well. I don't know if he really said it or not, but if he did, it's true, right? We can credit the guy back who's back. out. Yeah, the guy or gal who's out there fighting a good fight, and yeah. whether you win or lose, at least you know how it feels to go go do the the big fight. So for some reason, it resonates for me when I'm on the sidelines at like my kids' sporting events, and the parents are screaming. Yeah, my kids, my kids are big into sports too, and I and we watch a lot of sports, and we're and it is the psychology of thinking about you know what it's like to be that age and being out there competing, and you know that. You know, you always hate to drive home with them when they've lost a match oh, or, a game yeah. or whatever, but that's when they learn. And you know, that's when we learn. And I think that's what that quote's about is you're not always going to win. Yeah. But how do, how much do you learn? Yeah. Um, okay. So if you could have a superpower, what would it be? I have a superpower. What would it be? I think it would be, um, so, I mean, again, these are super hard questions. I'm uh, giving you really hard ones. I literally go like mashed potatoes or baked potatoes, like for some people. But there was so much I wanted to ask you that I was like, maybe I can like disguise it through the rapid fire questions. I think it's, you know, superpowers for me would be, you know, how how do you just EQ to, I feel like I have a fair bit of EQ, but I think yeah. I would love more of that. I mean, because it's always in the nuance. It's never in the, you know, and so much of business is about, you know, it's about EQ. It's about reading a room and understanding where people are. Uh, and I've thought a lot about that lately is I just wish I, I'd love to double down. And it's not something, you know, you can get out of a book. You just have, it comes from experience, right? So my superpower would be EQ. I More EQ. have to say we've only known each other for uh, what half hour, which is weird because I agree we should know each other, but I'm a very good reader of people. And I think you've got very high EQ. I think that's one of your superpowers already. I'm guessing. I bet you if I asked around, people would be like, yeah, that guy. 100%. But you want more. That's what makes you have high EQ is that you recognize it's important. Well, you told me to be honest. I mean, sometimes I just totally miss something. Like, really? You know, especially in managing people and that sort of thing where you just you go into a situation, you kind of have this battle plan, or especially if it's, you know, tricky or whatever, I don't know, with a customer or with, a, with somebody you manage or whatever. And Sometimes you just totally get it wrong and you go home and you just think, God, how did I like, how did I miss that? And I, yeah. I do that sometimes. And I, you know, that's when I reflect on EQ because it's not an exact science. And do you, you know? ever go back to the person and then like, say like, Hey, I thought about this last night. And I mean, talk about with that, with a customer or with an employee, talk about how far that goes. Wow. Most I leaders don't do that. What I love about being 51, I know we're not supposed to talk about that and stuff, but I, I love being older and being so much more comfortable in my own skin. And I do that all the time. I think I am much, much more apt to go back to a situation and just say, hey, I just totally got that wrong and yeah. I'm going to try to make it better. That's um, great. I mean, it doesn't you're you're okay being people. vulnerable because you're you're comfortable and you're confident with vulnerability, which does come with, with age and, and experience for sure. Well, okay. if you had that when we were 30, I just think about how much more we could have done or I could have done if I had just been open to that, you know? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to get into what you have done because you've done quite a lot. So you should be very proud. But I'm going to hit you with your very last question. It's what three words would your friends use to describe you? I hope they'd say energetic, optimistic, and maybe... Uh, Um, I hate, I hate this word, but I think they would say I'm reliable. Like I do, I I'm going to do what I, I'll do what I say I'm going to do. And I think yeah. that's a good one, even though it's a little boring. I don't think it's, it's a very good quality in a friendship though. When you really yeah. think about what you want in a friend who you can count on, right? That's great. Um, okay. So let's get into it. You are in Seattle. That's where I'm, that's where we, uh, are crossing paths, but where are you from originally it's from the South? And I love, you definitely have this voice for radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I, uh, it's funny. You say that I worked at a radio station when I was a kid. Uh, I grew up in a tiny town in Arkansas, 1500 people called Berryville, Arkansas. That's where I grew up. 1500 people, 1500 people. I think today it has 3000. So it's grown a lot, but uh, it was tiny, tiny town. So there's uh, like my, a post office, Arizona. like a bakery. Quintessential, like Southern little town, uh, town square. My dad owned the hardware store on the square, Maine and Maine. And yeah. it was a tiny town. And 
we knew everybody and everybody knew us. And that's just where we'd grown up for generations. So. And I and I did do some research and read that that's where uh, Clinton was doing some of his campaigning. Right. Well, I mean, Arkansas is right? not a big place. So when you ran for governor or attorney general of Arkansas, you inevitably came to this town. To the hardware we, store, though, the, the, specifically. Yeah. My, I mean, my grandfather and my we, that's what we did when we were kids. I mean, we had a hardware store. That's what my whole family, we all worked in the hardware store. My great, great grandfather started it. And my grandfather in this little town, I mean, he held court in the hardware store. That's what, that's where everybody gathered in the morning, had coffee. And that's amazing. Shot the breeze. And so inevitably politicians that were running for office would come through there. And Bill Clinton came there many times um, into the store and, this is back, you know, well before he ever contemplated running for president, but he certainly yeah. was in there. Yeah. I'm curious. Let's go back to the hardware store. Are you handy? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, can you My come over? Definitely does can you come over handy. and fix some things? No, yeah, not no. so much. Oh, God. I wish I had that though. I had it when I was a kid. My dad, you know, I kind of, that's one of those things that I look back on my dad and my grandfather and it's like, you know, they just fixed things. They just knew how to do stuff. And, and I think we've lost all that. You oh, know, we completely lost all of that. You know, Beyond. something happened. What would we do, right? There's some basic things that I feel like everyone should know how to do. I, I guess I'm not supposed to say like the men or the women, like everyone, like everyone should know how to do some basic things. And I agree. It's like crazy. <laughs> so, so you've been around entrepreneurship kind of your whole life, like generations of entrepreneurs. Um, did you think when you were little that maybe that was a path that you'd want to take, or was it expected that maybe you would take over the family business? Oh, it was hundred percent expected that I would take over the family business. And, and I, and I, I, that opportunity existed and I just didn't, it, you know, road took me a different direction. And I don't think my family was disappointed in me in any way. They wanted me to go do what I wanted to go pursue. And it just didn't take me down that road. Um, and I always did want to be an entrepreneur. My, my, my parents were, I look, I often look back on my dad and my grandfather and running a, a hardware store in a small town is a hard job. I mean, you, you know, that's where I learned a lot about, you know, my dad, I, I remember one of those poignant memories I have as a kid is delivering appliances to my dad on Friday nights uh, out in the country, right. Taking a refrigerator to somebody. And I would often say to my dad, I would, I remember saying this to him. I would say like, dad, it's like Friday night. I, can't we just be at home? And my dad would say to me, we deliver things when people want it delivered, because that's what we do. And I always thought that was a sacrifice. And yeah, I look back today and I think, you know, that's where I learned about being customer focused, right? You know, that's, that's your livelihood and in a small town, you know, you do what you need to do. And I just thought that was, he was a great role model for that. hundred percent. And do you have siblings and where are they now? Where is the family now? I've got a brother. Uh, all my family's still in Arkansas, except for me. Uh, I've got a brother in Little Rock, and I was asking you about your tennis career, but my brother played uh, NCAA basketball for Arkansas for several years and won a Final Four. And like my brother has his own uh, story back in Arkansas, but uh, one brother, and that's it. And he's a couple years younger than I am, and uh, and he got all the a athletic ability, <laughs> and I got none of it. <laughs> and do they still have the hardware store? No, the hardware store closed a few years ago. Um, it just, you know, small town hardware stores have just moved on. Unfortunately, it's just that business model doesn't work as the way it once did. But uh, it was, I still have this such a romantic, I, when I go back to my hometown, the building still there was this old, you know, 19th century building. And it just, it, it just so, it's such a romantic idea to think about what it was like to, you know, in its heyday. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you think back on like at middle school, high school, what were some of your big dreams? Were you, what were you envisioning for your life at that point? I mean, to be honest, with you, most people in small towns in Arkansas, they kind of stay around and they, yeah. they grow up there. You know, you play high school football and you graduate and you, you do what you'd kind of expect. Uh, you know, people didn't really leave home very often. And I always knew that I wanted to go out and see the world. My mother was really, really good at showing us, I mean, we didn't have a, too much when we were kids, but, you know, we do these driving vacations and we drive all these places. And I just remember my mother really trying to show us as much as we could see. And um, and I just knew I wanted to go out and see what was out there. And it was, a you know, and I didn't know what that meant, but 
that to me meant meeting people who could show you new experiences. And yeah, again, you know, your parents are so influential and encouraging you to do those things. Yeah, There's never expectation that I was going to, if I wanted to stay, that was great. If I wanted to fly the coop, that was totally fine too. That's great. That unconditional love feeling is like incredible. So that you feel like you, you know, you can let your wings fly. And so, so tell me about college. How'd you make the choice to go to school in Arkansas and, um, how was that? Was that the right choice for you? Would you study? Yeah, I think it was the right choice for me. I mean, I, I didn't, I don't know that I knew a lot beyond the borders of Arkansas, really, right? That was, that was kind of what uh, you did. And I knew lots of, you know, lots of my friends were headed over that direction. So uh, the University of Arkansas actually has grown immensely since I went there. Um, but it was, it was fun. We had a great time there. Uh, I studied public administration had a really influential mentor early on, a woman named Ann Henry, who was actually very involved in Arkansas politics. And she ended up kind of becoming a major player in my life during that time, kind of guiding me, helping me understand. And, and she was one of those special people who just, you know, she had evolved as a person and really understood the world, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more sophisticated way than maybe other folks that I was, you know, working with at, at, at university. And she took me under her wing and just helped me. And, you know, public administration, I'm not sure that was a particularly valuable uh, degree to, to go get, but it, it exposed me to lots of things. And and ironically, I ended up, you know, using it pretty effectively in my first job. Oh, yeah. Uh, so your very first job was your very first job in D.C. in the White House, like right out of school or tell me, like you get out of college, then what? Well, I mean, it started before I got out of college. So Bill Clinton announced he was going to run for president in 1991, my final yes. year in college. And, you know, for those of us who grew up in Arkansas, the fact that we even knew of someone running for president was, you know, pretty amazing. So I, you know, we had this relationship with him. My dad and my grandfather had both worked for Bill Clinton at different times um, in politics. And, um, you know, he announces and I'm, you know, I thought, gosh, how am I going to get involved in that? that? I was kind of interested in politics and I thought once in a lifetime opportunity. So I I wouldn't say I quit school in my senior year, but I certainly took a lot of time off to go do things on his behalf in this campaign. And when he started, I think it was October of 91. I mean, that would have been the beginning of my senior year. I, I remember there were like five people who really thought he could win. I mean, that was a it was a big group of people running for president. And there just weren't a lot of it was still pretty far out. And um, I went on the road a little bit and tried to help. And um and then ultimately, you know, he won, you know, he, 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 you know, he gets momentum kind of in the back half of that 1992 year and, you know, gets the nomination and then, uh, you know, beats George Bush. And I graduated in May and a friend of mine, uh, very, my closest friend in Washington, in, in uh, Fayetteville, uh, he and I decided we're going to go, we're going to go see, if we can go get a job, right? We're just going to take a risk. And I remember this was actually a really influential moment i had a i had a job offer from tyson foods which was the big chicken oh yeah we know tyson stuff. foods for sure yeah i mean it's like super serious great company yeah. you know opportunity to grow or whatever and my mother i tell my mother i go mom i'm not going to take the tyson food job i'm going to go to washington and she goes well do you have do you have a job in washington and i go no we, we're just gonna we're gonna go and i think to her credit she said follow your dreams, do whatever you want to do. And I, I, you know, walked away from that. And I, uh, this friend and I, we literally drove to Washington without a job, without a place to live. We loaded our cars and all our stuff. We drove up there and we stayed, we stayed in this little, stay at the town motel out in Alexandria for like a week trying to figure out where we were going to live. And it was just one of those moments where you're just like, can't believe I did that. <laughs> it was so character building. And, uh, you know, we, we started to network our way around Washington. Obviously, we knew a number of people who had moved up there. And to get to try to get to the answer on what was your first job, I uh, Stephanie Street, who was the president's scheduler, was I'd gone to school with her brother, and he let me go down and chat with her. And you know, here we are. She's working in the White House. I actually get to go in and see someone who's there. This is you know four or five months in administration, in the first year, and she said you know, why don't you, I think the best way to get a job in Washington is like, just try to find a, a volunteer spot where you can just get in and get your foot in the door. 
And I, she sent me down to the press office and I met this woman and she said, yeah, you can volunteer, you know, after the first 15 minutes of getting to know each other. And she said, I got all kinds of things you can do. And, uh, she, I just remember her going, when can you start? And I go, well, like, how about now? Like, I'm ready to go right now. And we literally, uh, Catherine was her name and we started working together and we just got along great. And after about five months, uh, a position came open in the travel office, which kind of looked after the press. And she goes, do you want to, do you want to work here? And I'm like, absolutely. I want, I want to work here. And I remember driving home that afternoon, calling my mother saying, Hey, I'm going to work in the white house. And it was like, you know, junior of junior, junior, junior jobs, but you know, I had a pass. I got to go in there and, and that was my first job in Washington. That's so crazy. Is that how it goes down? Like I've never, I always think that's such a cool experience and especially for young people to be, to be working in DC. Um, I recruited in New York for a long time and a lot of the resumes, you know, looked similar to yours, those first, you know, three to five years out of school. And they just always described it as the best years ever. Very social, super prestigious, tons of learning, um, you know, working on like-minded, super bright young people. Is that how it was for you? Yeah. And I, I think that's exactly how it works. And, you know, Washington is such a transient, fast moving. I mean, it favors people who are really open and are willing to work really hard. And it, you know, I think there's always this sort of, I mean, I, I came to Washington with my University of Arkansas degree. I didn't know really anyone. I, you know, I had this big chip on my shoulder a long time about people who went to fancy schools and, and, you know, had pedigrees and new people. And what I realized really quickly was, you know, Washington is actually made for people who just want to work hard and learn as fast as you can. And I, a lot of people ask me about how to get a job in Washington today. I still give them exactly the same advice I followed when I went there, which is get up there, you know, network around, meet some people that really, you know, start your engine, some organizations that you're excited about, and you will find a job. You know, you're not going to find you know, you're talking about entry level job, but right. get your foot in the door. Right. But be and, willing to do that. Right. Yeah. Be willing yeah. to do those like the menial tasks. Yeah. That totally, totally makes sense. And it's such a meritocracy too. You know, I think Washington really favors people who are, you know, if you're smart and you're hardworking, you, they are going to pluck you out of there and, and move you up the ladder really quick. So you're there over seven years, ended at the president's aid role. What is that position? So since, I think since um, Thomas Jefferson, maybe, they've had this role called the president's aide, and it's like the just the coolest job in the world. So each president has sort of a, I don't know, aide de camp kind of, you know, it's not a senior job, right? You are, you are just the guy who is there all the time, making sure the trains run on time, you know, carrying the briefcase. Uh, but I... I the job is amazing because it's the only job that I that I know of where you get to do and see everything the president does without any of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a magical. I mean, I already had this relationship with Bill Clinton that had gone on for several years with my family, so I knew him a bit. But then to get to step in, you know, and play this kind of unique role with him, I and mean, when we spent. You spend every day with him and, you know, you tra I traveled with him. I, you know, organized his day and it was just, it was the most magical job. Super hard, but very, you know, super magical. I was so oh, privileged sure. to get to do it. You know? I'm sure. What did you learn from him as far as like, um, you know, when you're around people and you're like, gosh, I want this quality. I wish I could like suck in all of this and come out the other side like in this way to emulate this human. I, I think two, I'd say two things. I'd say first his empathy for who he encountered, right? I cannot give you, I could never relate the number of examples of I saw him when he, I think mean, it started with listening. So his ability to listen to someone that maybe had never been listened to before. I mean, I can't, he, he would encounter people, you know, out on these travels that he, you know, he just had incredible empathy for. And then uh, and he was open enough where he could hear them and, and incorporate what he was hearing and, and, and then what he would do to go take action. And I think the second thing was 
he um, he used that empathy to go make things happen. And I think that's kind of not always understood about him, you know, that he was a he was a big listener. He could really internalize, I think, probably a lot from his own personal history, the scenarios he was hearing because he didn't grow up, you know, with a silver spoon in his mouth by any stretch, uh, had a lot of challenges. And I just think he, 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 he met, you know, growing up in the Ozark Mountains, you know, out there traveling around trying to find boats. I think, you know, talk about a guy who learned how to be high EQ. Mm. I think he really leveraged that in his benefit. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So then it becomes the year 2000. Your times, you know, come to an end in that chapter of your life. Was there an opportunity or did you consider staying on in government or what, what was your thinking around the next chapter and how did you end up in Seattle at Madrona? Well, as you, as you remember the 19, sorry, 2000, that was kind of the, the dot com. Uh, and I was like, go West young man. I was like, I got to go. Like you wanted to follow the, the internet chapter. boom. Yeah. And I interviewed in, in, in California. I knew I didn't want to be in government. I knew I wanted to get into business and, I interviewed in California and I interviewed with uh, um, Patty Stonecipher actually inter introduced me to the Madrona guys. And I, I came out here and I, I met uh, Tom Alberg, who I, you know, is just still someone I'm just feel privileged to have got to spend any time with. Uh, Matt McElwain had just started Madrona Venture Group. I mean, Greg Gottesman, that whole crowd. And I just it, it was just an opportunity to kind of learn from the bottom up and in, in business. And they took me on and and. That I just felt right. And I love Seattle. My best friend lived here and I'd come out for his wedding and I had never been to Seattle before. And I was like, what is this mystical, magical, weird place that is Seattle? And I, I just decided to take the leap and I found the role and I moved out here and I've yeah. been here ever since really. And was there, um, was that with the intention of kind of going in the path of um, an operating role or were you thinking that you were going to go the path of investor? I had no idea. I just even, I, I barely knew what, to be honest, with you, I barely knew what a venture capitalist did. I mean, I, you know, I, I was just starting my, my business career and Madrona was very influential because Madrona was really pretty early. I mean, they had just raised their first institutional fund. Um, you know, Seattle was just kind of coming to, into its own on the tech, you know, the tech scene. And it was an opportunity to work with some very, very smart people who were, you know, they were putting it together, you know, as we were doing it as much as I was. And I, mm. and they gave me the opportunity to see it. Um, I realized pretty quickly that I, I, I needed to be though in a more structured environment to really, you know, I mean, I was coming in with, you know, zero business experience. Right. And that's how I kind of ended up at Starbucks ultimately. Yeah. Well, Starbucks is really the bulk of your career. I mean, on what, almost 17 years. Um, and I love that you started their director of government affairs and public policy. And when you hear about those types of jobs, they sound so um, like, oh, of course there's that role. But it's also like, what does that person do? <laughs> like, Well, that's a, that's kind of an odd story because I Howard Schultz was somebody I'd met while I was through at the White House. And, uh, you know, he and I actually became, I wouldn't, I mean, this Howard Schultz came to the White House in 1993 at the president's invitation to talk about health care when literally, I mean, I remember being at the event, nobody really knew what Starbucks was. I mean, certainly in Washington, uh, maybe out here they did. And, you know, I kind of stayed in touch with him. He just he and I kind of hit it off and um, we stayed in touch through that whole time. And uh, when I moved out here, he called me one day when I was at Madrona and said, hey, we're kind of, you know, we're getting bigger and maybe you should come down here. And I want to ask your advice on a couple of things around like the government. And we got into this whole conversation. He said, why don't you come down here and help us like figure out how to put this whole thing together um, on, you know, just starting to see how Starbucks interacted with some of these, you know, frankly, stakeholders that are just not some group they thought about before, you know, Congress, the White House, you know, uh, and we, you know, what, what does that position do? I don't think we knew what it did at the time. It began to put together a strategy for a company that had a lot of, uh, had a lot of exposure, frankly, with the government, both in the United States and globally at that point in trade, in healthcare, mm. in tax, in, you know, employing lots of people. And you can't ignore those things as a, as a good sized company. And we just helped put that together early on. Yeah. Interesting. 
Yeah, I always have been curious about those roles. And then that makes sense when you're saying it that way. And so then did you live, um, I know that you've worked globally for Starbucks, but did you move all around with Starbucks? You lived in those different countries, London, Austria, oh. UK. I mean, are you just running that from Seattle? Like, what No, 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 we lived all those places. You lived all those places? We did. Um, so I think the, the thing about Starbucks, you know, so Starbucks was a great move for me because it, it put me in a structured environment where I could learn. And there were people around that had the time to teach me how to do what I was doing. And I could add some value on this government thing. And I remember saying to Howard, I said, Howard, we'll, so we'll, we'll get this solved. We'll get this set up. And, but, but I really want to be on the business side. And he, you know, to his great credit, he let me do that. Um, we spent about two and a half years kind of getting organized and then getting a team put together. And then I said, I really want to go get in operations and, um, not not really realizing what a risk that was at the time, but um, to his credit, he he introduced me to the operations team, and I found this opportunity, and actually moved to the UK um, to begin my operations career, and spent really the next you know the rest of my time there, the next you know 13, 14 years running you know in operations. Uh, my wife and I moved to London um, twice. I lived in Switzerland by myself for a while. Yeah, we and and honestly, I mean, this is all um, this is all we're truncating this really, you know, and down to a, a couple of minutes. But I mean, some of our best times as a family were living overseas. I mean, the oh, I can only go, imagine. How many kids do you guys have? Two kids, two kids. thirteen and ten. Thirteen and ten. So with the kids, yeah. So this overlaps. I'm like doing the math in my brain. Yeah, my son was born in London. Okay. My daughter was just 18 months old when we moved over there. And, um, you know, we just, we just, just, again, it was magical. It was like, you know, getting to represent this big, important brand, but, but it was hard. It was hard markets. You know, these were hard markets, France and Switzerland and the Middle East, you know, places that we had to kind of uh, build the business in a, in a, you know, in a place where they didn't understand the brand like we do here in America. Right. Uh, But culturally it was just so fascinating. I mean, to get to just drop into these markets and think differently about how to position Starbucks uh, and to build the company, you know, especially a retail company uh, was a great challenge. And we had a great time. I mean, both my so family. Tell me more about Middle East and Africa. Did you live both those places? No, I, uh, so I had two jobs. I, when I first went to the Europe, uh, I had the UK business. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the president of the European business left and I, uh, you know, was privileged to lead that business. Uh, and that's where I kind of picked up the Middle East and Africa. We had a very small business at that time. We just kind of entered, uh, you know, UAE through Dubai. And, you know, for some reason, they are just crazy about coffee, American coffee brands in the Middle mm-hmm. East. And um, we began to build that business out um, with a family from Kuwait. We had a sort of franchise agreement over there, license agreement. And then actually, you know, Africa, we, we were in Africa in Morocco in a very small way, just a few stores. And I got the really, I mean, the most fun I had at Starbucks was opening South Africa because we we got to, you know, kind of, you know, obviously the southern part of Africa is so different than, than North Africa. And the opportunity to go down there and really think through how we were going to enter a market that was just really was a coffee growing, it was an origin country, uh, had such a different you know, approach to retail. And it was just, again, super fun to do it from, you know, zero to a hundred. And, you know, now we have a great business down there, but. um, Incredible timing of, of the, you know, growth story of Starbucks, like your timing. How cool. I remember those days with Starbucks. I was super lucky. I remember thinking when I first talked to Howard, I think we had 500 stores. And I remember saying to my wife, I was like, kind of, I mean, we missed the boat here, like 500 stores. Like this thing has already gotten away from us. And when I left Starbucks a few years ago, we had 31,000 stores across the world. Oh my gosh, 31,000. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, to get to ride that, that I mean, Howard calls it the, the magic carpet. I mean, it really was. We just, such a fun, fun ride. And, and I love that company. And, you know, we did it the right way, right? We built it the right yeah. way. As much of what tell me, I'm, tell me what you can about the Starbucks culture and how it's informed. Well, I'm, we're going to get into Aegis also, um, 
I haven't had Howard Schultz on the podcast. I have had Dwayne Clark on the podcast. Um, but I'm curious about how you would describe, I've, I've met with a lot of people that have left Starbucks and also have recruited for Starbucks a little bit. I'm curious your way of describing the Starbucks culture and how it's informed your leadership style. I think it, you know, it, it's a servant leadership led organization, you know, where genuinely people come to work in the morning and they think, you know, no matter what role you're in, especially if you're in a leadership role, my job is to support those stores and the people in them. And, you know, I, I don't think many people would probably like me saying this, but I don't know that we think about the customer nearly as much at Starbucks as we did the barista who worked in the store. And there was just this basic, basic formula that if you supported the folks who worked in the stores really, really well, they knew how to do the right thing for the customer. And I, I don't want to say it's more complicated than that because I just don't think it is. Yes, there's a lot of behind that, but that was the basic philosophy. And that really worked. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, and yeah. also just the way that Starbucks takes such good care of their employees and just um, the, all of the work around just, e e e and, you know, equity, just everything. I think that it's an incredibly forward thinking um company. I've just always been very impressed with the values. And if people seem happy, you can kind of feel the energy when you're in the corporate office. Yeah, I mean it's never perfect, right? I mean there's just no never a perfect thing. But I think if you're starting from that place, you're you're in so much of a better position to get to convince people to support the business model, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think Howard was gifted. He he saw way ahead of that curve. And so many of us, I mean, even in the business I have today, right, we have adopted many of those, you know, everybody at Ripple, my current company has equity in the company. Everyone. everyone. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, we, we're focused on providers, right? All those are direct, you know, Starbucks learnings, right? The yeah. To deliver success. And so what motivated your transition from Starbucks to get into a whole different sector. I know we've talked about a few pivots in your career. Uh, it takes a lot of courage. What made you like, was that a specific like passion move for you? Or someone recruited I, you or how did that happen? Well, it's like everything that it's like everything that sort of happens. It seems very simple now, but as you look back, right. So two or three things were happening. Howard stepped down and Kevin Johnson took over. Uh, and I think it was just, you know, Kevin was awesome. Uh, but it was just a different era, right? It was just for those of us who've been around for a long time, I think it was a moment to kind of say, maybe we all do something different. And we've been lucky, right? I was fortunate, frankly, to be in a place where I could go do, take yeah. a big risk on something. And also about that time, both my parents independently, they're not together, but had near misses with the healthcare system. I mean, big ones, like death defying near misses with the healthcare system. And I was just flabbergasted, you know, not really knowing much about healthcare, that that either of those scenarios could happen. And the fact that that happened at the same time was just. And the other thing I kept watching was, you know, I think, again, you and I have grown up in almost the same way from a, a timing standpoint. In the old days, right, we knew our grandparents, we kind of, but we never really paid much attention to older people. It was just kind of, you know, that wasn't like a big category of, of business anybody thought much about. And what I started to realize was, you know, when I read the papers in the morning, I just saw a lot more stories on, you know, the kind of coming wave of older people. And I started to look at that. And what I realized really quickly, I think we'll get into this. I don't I think we really dislike old, older people in America or we would have much better infrastructure to support them. 100%. But I just think people don't know what's coming. I mean, there is the biggest wave of all time of change, you know, in in who we're going to be taking care of, um, you know, for the first time in a couple of years, in the first time in history, we're going to have more older people being above 65 than we are some, you know, people under the age of 18. And we are radically unprepared for, for that transition uh, in a healthcare infrastructure. So I saw, you know, to try to answer your question, I saw the opportunity to say, gosh, that seems like man, if Starbucks is a big opportunity, it seems like older people in healthcare is a big opportunity. I wonder if I can go be a part of that solution, especially because I thought my parents got such a raw deal and I thought I can go try to fix that a little bit. So naive though, honestly. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm like, I, I get it. It hits so deeply for me, 
my parents are still completely, you know, relatively healthy. They're 78 and 79. Um, but they're like young and spry. I think you've probably met them. Um, but it's, it's scary when you think about that next stage of life and to just make sure that they have everything that they need to feel comfortable and to live the life that they want to live. And it feels overwhelming to try to make a difference. And I can get it why you'd want to like going to Aegis Living, being the president there, cool company, obviously incredible. But how do you even begin to chip away at that? It's such a big category. Um, yeah, I mean, I, here's what I'd say. I, I remember when I made that move, my friends just said to me, like, what are you doing? Like, why you could go get a job in a retail company and keep going. Why are, why are you doing that? And I, I really, I felt very compelled. I have this really soft spot in my heart for older people, especially older people without a lot of resources. And I think that is a lot about growing up in Arkansas, because I saw so many people that just didn't. They just got a raw deal. Uh, and I mean, if you look in, particularly in rural parts of America, I mean, they're closing hospitals, they're closing clinics. Uh, you know, we, we are getting less healthy, not more healthy. And I think most people don't really understand that. Like these I big, don't get it though. We're putting so much energy into this the wellness and it makes no sense. I mean, I know that the eating thing and sleeping and exercise, but like, why are we so sick? Because we have a sick care system, we have a we have a system of healthcare that that rewards um, investing in sick care as opposed to preventative care. And yes, you you're seeing a bunch of wellness stuff, but most people don't. You're in a yeah, no. you know you're in a privileged spot. We get to yeah. sit here and think yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know we're we're serving a lot of folks over in Spokane right now, and we you know particularly south of Spokane, down the Palouse there, you know, on the Idaho border, we, we were out the other day in assisted living community. And you know what? These are folks that desperately need help and it's not there. And we're only deal dealing with the mental and behavioral health side, but it's it's very broad. And, um, and the thing that's scary about this is that we're not even, so the first boomer will turn 85 in the next five years or so. And it is just hard to imagine how many people are suddenly going to need really advanced care. Uh, that that is not that's not debatable, and we are just not prepared for it. And again, at Ripple, we're just biting off a, a you know a small piece of the need in behavioral and mental health, but you cannot believe what's coming. And I think people have not really gotten their heads around what you know what's going to happen. And I. I tell my 13 year old daughter all the time, I said, you better like healthcare and you better like older people because that's what you're going to do. I mean, we are all going to do that for many, many years in the future. Tell me, tell me about Ripple, the, the origin story, your co-founder and how did you come up with the idea, the name, how did it get funded, all of that? Well, I was at Aegis and what I was noticing, I mean, the, the experience at Aegis to take care of older people in these congregate care environments was like, especially during COVID was like maybe the most humbling, profound thing I've ever done. And it really convinced me. I mean, I always knew that I would really like it, but it really convinced me that this was like, this was noble work, right? We got to go help older people. And they're just, it's not a sexy place, right? I mean, nobody, who wants to go work taking care of like frail older people, right? If you don't have to, well, it's a big opportunity and there's a lot of mission in it. And I've always needed that in my work. And what I was seeing at Aegis was we were oftentimes sending uh, residents to the ER uh, because we didn't have the clinical capability to manage uh, their behavioral symptoms related to dementia. And this is not Aegis or any place else. This is everywhere, right? And as I began to try to look at that problem, uh, I'm making a long story short here, I began to realize that this is a gigantic gaping hole in the healthcare system. That if you're out there and you have a mental or behavioral health condition as an older adult, and I'm talking about real seniors, right? 75, 85, 95 years old, you got nobody. And uh, I, I began to try to, to solve it. And I realized there was this very, very big business opportunity to try to go to sort it out. And I can get into all the reasons why it exists and that sort of thing. But Bob Nelson, who is the, um, 
managing partner, Arch Ventures, who I actually sat next to at Madrona when I started in 2000, who was sharing office space with them. And he and I had become uh, acquainted and friends. He called me one day because we were on this board together and he, he was asking me, you know, like, what do you see in senior care? And do you see any opportunities? And I go, man, I've got I've got a big one. Let's let's go. You know, maybe we should go work on this together. And in that 10 minute call, we decided we would go. You know, Bob is famous for taking on really, really difficult, you know, healthcare problems that are kind of intractable. He loves that. You know, the harder, the better. And we just started talking about this. And literally 10 minutes later, he said, let's go do it. So that's how we decided. Wow. And I left and we we took it on. When we first started raising money, I mean, we went, we, we did a number of things. I, I went out to uh, McLean Hospital, which is one of the Harvard hospitals out in Boston. And we spent some time out there. Kind of, They're the number one psychiatric hospital in the country. And we just tried to learn as much as we could. Is this, you know, was what I was seeing with residents in the ER. Are there really a lot of older people with dementia in the ER unnecessarily? Um, and it turns out that that is not only true, but it's dramatically true. And we, you know, we did a bunch of other kind of research in, in looking at this, had actuaries actually study the claims data. And we validated that actually it's, there really are unnecessarily a lot of older people in ERs. And unfortunately, once they get to the ER, they, you know, they're three times more likely to end up in the hospital. Uh, then they typically go to a nursing home or rehab. And sometimes, you know, many times they don't make it home. And that could be any for a number of reasons, but even if you don't like older people and you say, you know what, who cares? You know, they're old, you know, and that you'd be surprised at who believes that. Even if you don't think that's important, the cost of these folks is exponential, uh, particularly in our space. So mental and behavioral health um, is one of the most expensive conditions out there. In fact, um, uh, it's the most expensive of, you know, neurocognitive diseases are the most expensive end of life disease there is, if you look at it, especially in the final year. And I'm going to try to answer your question. We started raising money. Uh, we went to all the, you know, traditional players, as you can imagine, and venture, and they were really skeptical. I mean, I remember this, having some conversations like many entrepreneurs and you're first starting, you know, beating your head against the wall. How do I help them see the opportunity the way I see it? Right. And, and it took it took about eight months. And when we closed our round in September of last year, we had a syndicate that I think was as blue chip as I could have ever imagined, way better than I ever imagined. Uh, thank, you know, thanks to Bob and many others who helped us. But they see the opportunity. And it was Google Ventures and General Catalyst and Arch Ventures, um, F Prime, which is Fidelity, and uh, Mass General Hospital. And I genuinely like look at that group and it's like, I can't believe how lucky we are to have such incredible investors who really understand the opportunity and can help us, you know, take this on. And what did you describe when you first um, pitched the business as your um, business model, business plan, and has it pivoted or changed at all since then? Uh, uh, yeah, well, has it changed? I mean, like every day it changes, yeah. right? Is we're yeah. trying to we're so early, right? We're yeah, we're, figuring it out. I mean, we took so originally when we identified this opportunity. Okay, why if you're at home alone and you have dementia and you're caring for your spouse, or your sister, or your brother, you know, how do we give you a resource, be it clinical or social or whatever it is, so that when you run into a problem, how do we give you a resource that you can call? that will say, hey, here's the answer instead of going to the ER. Because what happens today is that you're, you know, seven o'clock on a Tuesday night, you're an 85-year-old woman taking care of your 90-year-old uh, husband who's mid-stage dementia. If he begins to get aggressive or have behaviors, which is very, very common with Alzheimer's and other dementias, um, you know, you get nervous, you've never seen this behavior, what do you do? Well, you're not going to call your doctor because they're not going to pick up. You may call the, the nurse line down at the local hospital and they're immediately going to send you to the ER and then you go to the ER because that's what's available to help you. And unfortunately, once you cross that threshold, the ER doesn't they, they don't have the training either. And you end up sitting there and this is these are real numbers. You will sit there for five to eight hours. You will then oftentimes be admitted to the hospital for somewhere between three and 11 days. 
And because it's psychiatric or behavioral or mental, it depends on how you kind of categorize it. Oftentimes it's very hard to discharge you because there is no place that has the capability to take care of you. And we are trying to get in the very, very front of that. We're using a, a collaborative care model of highly specialized nurse practitioners, uh, licensed social workers and care coordinators working together in a, a virtual pod to try to be that resource for you and to call instead of you know having the only option of going to the ER. And I know it sounds crazy, but there's just this, you know, post-diagnosis, especially with Alzheimer's today, it's a black hole, uh, you know, for, for families and patients. I mean, they genuinely, I've, and I've watched this happen many times, once you get that diagnosis, you know, here's a, here's a, a brochure for the Alzheimer's Association. They have some resources that perhaps can help you. And they are awesome. We, we've gotten to know them very well. But they don't, they don't offer necessarily... This, the wraparound holistic care that, you know, we need to really keep somebody at home for as long as they right. can. So now pretend I'm a, I call Ripple. I'm the 85 year old woman. My 90 year old husband has acting aggressively. What happens then? I call the company and what do I get? And what do I, how do you make money? Yeah. Well, there's two different things. I'll do the, what you get. And then I'll tell you how we make money. Um, what you get is you get a resource. So first of all, we know you. We already know you. We have to have you. We have to know you before we can do this. You know, Alzheimer's and dementia and neurocognitive diseases are they're tricky because they're they're predictable but unpredictable. I tell people a lot, right? If you've never seen it, very unpredictable. So we really need to understand and know the patient and their medical history. So we'll have to have had that patient on board before that call comes. But then when the call comes, I think our job is to triage the situation and give you clinical or social support that would allow you to solve whatever's happening and determine whether it's really an emergency. You know, oftentimes a complicating factor here is that, you know, someone who's 85 doesn't just have Alzheimer's. They may have a number of things, right? And we use family nurse practitioners that are really specialized in this, pl this, pl this space that can really do a good job of triaging the situation. And hopefully, if it's truly related to the cognitive condition, you know, taking you through how we're going to solve this. Um, and again, be it clinical or social and, and keeping you out of that ER. And I think nine, time, nine, or nine out of those 10 calls, we can do that um, with this really kind of holistic care model that, um, again, is primarily virtual and you know, leverages specialization because one of the big problems here is there's no one out there. And when I say no one, Jerry psychiatry, which is obviously medical, you know, MD level psychiatry, it is the smallest practice out there. There's nobody getting into Jerry psychiatry, which is ironic because that is who we're going to take care of in the next 30 years. A hundred percent, 100 percent agree with you. So what, how does the company make money? How do we make money? Um, well, we're going to thread a needle here, right? So you probably read a little bit about, there are two different kinds of sort of payment models in healthcare in America today. There's fee for service, which is really how you and I get our healthcare. We are the doctor and the doctor does things to us and they charge us on a fee schedule. And really when we go home, yes, I'm sure they want us to be healthy and get better and have good outcomes, but they still get paid no matter what. And in fact, the way fee-for-service healthcare works today, you're kind of incented to do as many things to you and I as you can, because that's how you would make more money. We are trying to build this model within a value-based system, which you know is becoming increasingly part of how we're going to deliver healthcare more efficiently. And basically, what that does is this: you contract with insurers or providers to deliver this care, and we get paid. Um, when we deliver good outcomes for you, meaning you have to, in dementia's case, right, you're not going to get better necessarily, but we're keeping you out of the hospital. We're delivering on some of these, these health outcomes that are, we're keeping you stable, you know, in your, in your current condition. And we're doing it less expensively than if you went just to, uh, end a fee for service healthcare. 
Um, because many people have different needs. There's no reason that I need to see you every three days to make sure you're doing okay. Maybe I can see you once a week or once a month or once a year. And I can customize that care for you. And again, we don't get paid unless, um, unless you get better or stay stable, if that makes sense. So, so the, fam the business way models, the, 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 families, the family's the one paying you. No, we're, well, who's paying ultimately, you? yes, but yeah. we're paid by insurance companies and yeah. accountable care organizations. Okay. So when you're doing outreach and BD, business development outreach, it's to insurance companies. That's who you're well, partnering with? We're really early. So yes, and we are also working uh, fee for service as we get started to prove the model out. You asked me earlier if we're if we're using the same model we started with. I mean, the reason this doesn't exist today is because fee for service healthcare doesn't pay for the holistic care mm -hmm. for some of these conditions. Mm -hmm. And and the irony of ironies, right? Which there are many in healthcare. Uh, oddly, going to the ER might be better in some scenarios for the payer. Um, not ultimately, but we're trying to give them an. A, we're trying to give a better answer to that, right? Keep you out of the ER to take care of you better and to take care of you less expensively. Um, Got it. Okay, that makes sense. So what markets are you currently in and what are your growth plans? We're just today in the state of Washington. So we just started serving patients at the end of January. And we're serving patients from, you know, Bellingham to Tacoma to Vancouver out to, you know, the Palouse and Spokane. So all across the state, all, most of our care is virtual, especially the clinical pieces of our care. So we really are very flexible in that way. Yeah. Um, how, how does someone know if they've got early onset dementia? Are there tests out there for it? I know that there's a lot of like, I just was reading about Martha Stewart, how she just looks so incredible right now. Literally this morning I was reading about her tips and she gets up in the morning and does her crossword puzzle to keep her brain going. But like, if she woke up one morning and was like, wait, this is weird. My crossword puzzle, I can't do it. Or I forgot where my keys are. Like, I forget where my keys are. How do you know when it's happening? Well, that so early onset is a very different condition than I would say traditional dementia. Like early yeah. onset, yes. You, you, you know, that's a very clinical scenario. And there are a number of different tests to, to decide whether you have that uh, from blood based to sort of uh, to, to visual assessments to you know, uh, basic cognitive assessments, which is really how it's been done for a long time. Most of what we deal with is what I would call traditional dementia, right? Uh, amyloid plaque on your brain. And, you know, typically, I mean, out of every hundred people, about 10 of those are, di of every hundred, you know, group of seniors above the age of 65, you know, eight to 10 of those will be diagnosed with some kind of neurocognitive disease. There's probably another 10 to 12, there may be more that are undiagnosed. As you know, there's a lot of stigma associated with dementia, uh, especially in rural environments where people, you know, they're pretty independent. And the last thing they want to be told is, that, you know, they're losing their memory or they're having difficulty there. So a big part of what we're doing is we are diagnosing dementia. We use an FDA approved assessment uh, that's pretty standard. Um, to help you recognize whether you actually have the disease or not. And there's lots of stages, right? There's what they call mild cognitive impairment, which is the early stages of dementia. And then there's, you know, dementia itself. And, you know, what people sometimes don't realize is the majority of dementias, there are probably 200 different kinds of dementia out there, but the majority of it is Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. it's what most people that encounter the disease uh, are dealing with. And that's what we see the most of and probably are most effective at helping people navigate and manage. Um, so, so it's more about managing it. It's not about slowing it down. There's nothing you can do. Like if you find out that you've got this mild cognitive early, you know, signs, it's like you just know what's coming. It's mm -hmm. not that you can say, oh, well, now I'll start eating more broccoli and sleeping more and taking these vitamins. Or is there something you can do? Well, I'm not. A these doctor. are probably these are probably not the best questions, but I'm actually like legit super curious. Well, it's a super interesting part of medicine. Like, I'm not a doctor. I'm going to say that I'll say that a hundred times, right? But in studying, 
you know, we're surrounded at the company at Ripple with, I think, some of the most progressive thinkers in the space. Um, from pharma, people who are deep involved in therapeutic development, to people who are, uh, you know, at McLean Hospital, deeply involved in, in progressing care models that, you know, figure out how to care for better pe people better with these conditions. But I think the broad answer to your question is, um, you know, there's a lot of good, you know, for the first time, maybe in 20 years, in the last three months, there's been some very positive news coming out of therapeutic development. So there are a couple of different drugs, Adjuhelm and Lacanumab, that have shown for the first time in, in a very long time, some ability to slow the progression of the disease, when really there's been nothing even remotely optimistic for a long time. Yeah, that's so, great news. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's early, but there's a lot of you know research and development going on in that space. Um, in fact, uh, Ryan Watts, who uh, co-founded and is the CEO of Denali Therapeutics, is one of the leaders in the space and de designing therapeutics for neurocognitive diseases has been a big influence on us and how to think about, you know, how we may help with that over time as these therapeutics become more available. But um, yeah, well, it's, 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 it's still very early. It's I know that it's early for the company, but it's a thank you on behalf of like everyone, because this is something that's important. And I'm glad that you um, have taken it on. And I'm excited to watch what you continue to build. I'm curious if you are um, drawing in talent, what you can tell people who are listening about why they should want to come work at Ripple um, beyond getting to work with you <laughs> and this incredible uh, challenge that you're taking on. I mean, obviously, I think it's going to be a passion play for a lot of people. People want a sense of purpose. Right now, I can tell you after 30 years of recruiting, I'm hearing that more than ever from candidates, but specifically about the culture and what makes someone successful there. What would you say? I, I mean, so I love this question because this is my favorite, favorite topic, right? The opportunity. I mean, so I feel lucky that I somehow found my way into healthcare. And, and like I said, I've always been very mission oriented. So, you know, compared to Starbucks, which I you know had some mission, this is like life and death mission. I, and I get up every day and I mean, I just am so grateful that I get that opportunity. And I think we're finding that, you know, I, I say this again, taking care of older, frail people with these conditions is not sexy. And yet that's why we need people to come and help us do it. Right. And I convince people all the time to come join us. And what we're finding is we have a really mature and experienced leadership team, frankly, people that. Uh, could be doing anything else they wanted to do. And we've convinced them to come over here and join us in this, you know, really something I think they'll look back on 20 years from now and say, wow, I mean, we, we changed the game. And 100%. that is hard to find, right? Very hard to find. Super uh, hard to find. I love it. I'm excited to continue to watch. So my final question for you is what fuels you? What we just talked about. I mean, I love... I, a couple of things. I love that we've taken on, it's back to Bob and I's conversation early on. This is one of the darkest, hardest, most difficult nuts to crack in healthcare. There, and I, and I, there's no doubt about that. I think I, as I've gotten around to, you know, various, there are lots of healthcare startups out there, right? Trying to solve various pieces of the pie. It's just so big, but like, I feel like we are putting a very big light into this corner and we are going to open this up. And look, uh, rising tide's going to lift all boats here, right? We're not going to, we don't have to own every part of this business. In fact, I think we'll spur lots of new companies to get into this space because this is a wide open category. Yeah. Despite the number of people that need help, despite, you know, this is not new. There is, there are just not many people out there in the space. So I hope we, we spur others to come in here and join us and see why this is such great work. Uh, the other thing that I would just add here is that we've tried to approach this brand. We haven't talked much about the brand, but, you know, I swear when you start a healthcare company today, the first thing you do is like you pick out the shade of aqua seafoam green you're going to put on the website. You're going to build a paragraph that tells people what to do and no one's going to understand it. Like I want to approach older people healthcare in a totally different way than has been done before right? This, we can be optimistic and hopeful 
And, you know, just because you get a dementia diagnosis, I mean, like we said all the time, like, man, it's, it's not the end of your life. You got lots of life to live. And maybe it's just a great reminder that you got to get your bucket list going and get out there and make it happen. And our job is to help you do that. Our job is to enable that. And that's 100%. the way we try to do it with our clinicians. It's a, I think it can be a, you know, dementia right now is position is this very sad, you know, dark place of, you know, abandonment and loneliness. And it's so not that, you know, yes, there's not a cure today, but man, there's not a cure for really lots of things that we could encounter. Uh, yeah. And we're going to, we're going to approach this very differently. And that's where Ripple came from, by the way. You know, oh, it's about, interesting. we picked Ripple because, you know, a Ripple is something that typically if you make enough of them turns into a much bigger wave. And I know that sounds a little hokey, but we are going to build this category. We're going to get a lot of new people into the space who know how to care for these folks. And we are going to build a wave uh, that's going to make the world better. So that's why I'm doing it every day.